You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Professor Jason Wright. Jason Wright is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State and a member of the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. He studies stars, their atmospheres, their activity and their planets, whilst also working on SETI. He is a project scientist for NEED, a PI of the Nexus for Exoplanet System Science, a co-PI of the Miniature Exoplanet Radial Velocity Array and a member of the Habitable Zone Planet Finder team. You can learn more about his research on his blog. There's a link in the description or by following him on Twitter at Astro underscore Wright. Jason Wright, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me again. Now, Jason, we have a signal, and this is a really strange one because it's a very close signal. It's Proxima Centauri. Yeah. Which comes with implications <laughs> of having a signal that <laughs> <That's> close. <right. laughs> but we'll get to that. Yeah. Now, this signal, what specifically is interesting about it? What What do you think piqued the interest of the researchers at Breakthrough Listen um, that made them say, hmm, this is something that we should take a closer look at? Yeah. So the hard part doing radio study like this isn't necessarily building a big enough telescope that can detect sensitive signals, although that might be part of it. The real hard part is that the radio spectrum is filled with technological signals on Earth and in space. And our telescopes are so sensitive that we pick them all up, even when we point them out into space at other stars. And so the the trick is you'll point the telescope in space, you say, do I see any technological signal? And the answer is yes, you'll probably see thousands or hundreds of thousands of signals coming from every cell phone, every aircraft radar, every FM station, and out there in space, all of our interstellar probes, our interplanetary probes, all of our low Earth orbiting satellites, all the nav satellites. There's just, it's it's a complete zoo of signals. So you have to filter that out. And the way they filter that out is through, with the Parkes telescope, is through what's called nodding. So you point, you point at your source of interest, you measure all of those thousands and thousands of signals, then you just nod the telescope like you might nod your head a little bit away, and you measure again. And all of those things on Earth and, and a lot of those things in space won't show up, be, or will continue to show up. And then you go back to your source and you do it again. And so you can sort of subtract off all the signals you see when you're not pointing. And what you're looking for are signals that are only there and always there when you point at your source and are never there when you point away. And what's so interesting about this source is that it has apparently survived that test. That is, it only appears when they point at the star Proxima and it apparently never appears when they point away from it, meaning it really is apparently coming from the star Proxima. What sort of, uh, do you have any idea on signal strength? Is this, a, is this a strong signal like the WOW signal was, or is this just a weak, you know, sort of? So, yeah, all I really know is what's in the articles, and the, 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 the news stories that have come out, and those have not said how strong the signal is. The Parkes telescope is extremely sensitive, and so it could be quite weak, it could be quite strong. I, I really don't know. What else they did say in the articles, I... I read them as well, is that it's a narrow band signal at 982.002 megahertz, which is very narrow. Now that raises eyebrows because that tends to say that's right. this is technological rather than astrophysical. Now that's right. Is there is could it be that there's just something, some unknown situation in astrophysics that can produce a narrow band signal like that that we just haven't thought of yet? Is that still a possibility? It's not. So I don't know how narrow band the signal is, but if it's past their tests, then it must be quite narrow band. And by narrow band, we mean something like a few hertz wide. And so again, with the caveat, I haven't seen the data, that they typically look for things that are a few hertz wide. And as you said, it's 982 megahertz. So that's millions of hertz. So that means if you wrote down exactly what frequency they see it at, it would be you know, 982 million zero 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 two, but not zero zero three at the end. So it's extremely narrow, 
that we're talking about. And so that's the second test that this signal has passed uh, if they're excited about it, that it's that narrow. And there's no way nature can produce such um, tightly packed energy into such a narrow frequency range. All the sources of radio waves in nature come from electrons that are flying around, for instance, in magnetic fields. And because they're moving around, they have some thermal velocities. Those velocities generate Doppler shifts. And so they have to produce radio waves at a range of frequencies, over, over at least kilohertz of frequencies. So if it's only a few hertz, it, it absolutely has to be technological. So even something like hydrogen at the hydrogen line floats around just because of blue and red shift of the hydrogen clouds moving. So you can't ever really, you know, you see it all over as a smear rather than a pinpoint. But it's exactly right. Human technology is very different because you try to do that and make it as narrow as you can just to save energy and target your signal. So that's right. It seems to scream technology. But what the problem is, is where it's coming from. <laughs> that's, that's right. The, that's exactly that's right. The, there's there's if it passed their tests. It, I'm, I'm willing to bet this is definitely of technological origin. The question is, is it coming from the Earth or is it coming from space? And if it's coming from space, is it something we put in space or is it something someone else put in space? That frequency of 982 megahertz is sort of weird mm -hmm. because we don't really use it as heavily as we do other yeah. areas of the of the uh, of radio. Why do you think that is? Um, yeah, I. I I don't know very much about the, the frequency allocations and the reserved frequency ranges and things like that. And my understanding is this is not a very commonly used part of the radio spectrum. It's not the, it's not the kind of place where you know all the cell phones are going and all of these other things are happening. It, it tends to be pretty clean, so they like to look there. Um, it's also in L-band, which is uh, classically the part of the radio spectrum that the earliest radio SETI practitioners looked for signals. And there are a lot of reasons why you might use L-band if you wanted to do interstellar communication through an atmosphere like Earth's. And that's because at lower frequencies, our atmosphere, really our ionosphere, blocks radio waves. And so we can't easily look for radio waves at lower frequencies than that. And then at higher frequencies, we get a lot of interference from Earth's atmosphere, from the water and other molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. And then eventually also there are contributions from um, the galaxy. The, the, all the electrons in the galaxy just create this sort of background static that makes it hard to find things. This is the sweet spot in between those two factors. And in fact, that's where, as you said, the, the hydrogen 21 centimeter line is. And it's sort of romantically been called the water hole because it's where you get both hydrogen and hydroxyl masers. They're actually right next to each other, those frequencies. And so the gap between them is called the water hole because hydrogen and hydroxyl will combine to form water. And then there's this kind of romantic notion, you know, where should we meet? We should meet at the watering hole, said Barney Oliver, and that's right in that gap. This isn't in that gap. Um, it's it's down at, at 980, not up at, at 1420, uh, but it's pretty close. And so this is actually, you know, where the original practitioners of radio said he originally would have gone looking. Another question there would be harmonics. I mean, doesn't that occur where you would, you know, multiple somewhere along the line? Does it actually match up with um, with any of the hmm. the usual suspects as far as frequencies that SETI looks? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I should go through and uh, go through and check. I suppose that's that's uh, that's an interesting idea. Hydrogen. The the most famous multiple uh, might be pi times hydrogen. I think that was the one in contacts, and so that would be fourteen twenty megahertz times pi divided by. This is you know it's it's more than half of fourteen twenty. So I, I don't recognize it right away, but yeah, maybe we should start digging into the numerology. Passing filters, you know, when you set up automatic filters and you try to eliminate signals that are noise or are of obvious something else, something that's not, you know, of alien origin, what does that look like? I mean, what is that process of elimination, even before you get to the human, what does mm. that look like? So the data they collect is just, I mean, it's an obscene data volume. They collect petabytes of data with these instruments. And the reason is that they have extremely wide bandwidth. So they can search, for instance, the entire region from, you know, short of, of one gigahertz up to two gigahertz, depending on what receiver they're using. 
that would be a billion channels basically because they have something like one hertz resolution. And so at the Green Bank Telescope at higher frequencies, they will collect four billion channels at once. And they'll sample those channels every 10 seconds or something like that. And so, and they'll do this for hours every day, all year long. That's just a, a huge amount of data. And there's no way, even with crowdsourcing or something, there's no way humans could look at it all. So you have to have computers going to find what you know what you think you might be looking for. So the most developed algorithms are the ones that look for these narrow band signals. And what they're going to do is they're going to look for a signal that only appears in a narrow range of frequencies and is persistent uh, as long as you're on the source. The other thing they actually look for, and this is the third test that this must have passed, in fact we know it's passed this test, is that the frequency changes. Because if the frequency is always the same, interestingly, you know it's not from space. And the reason is that the Earth is spinning. And so our telescope, during the observation, will change its direction. As the Earth rotates, its velocity, because of the Earth's rotation, changes. And that will change the Doppler shift that the telescope has toward any source off of Earth. And so if it's a source on the Earth, the distance between the telescope and that source on the Earth cannot be changing very fast. And so there's no, no Doppler shift. So the first thing they do is they just throw out any signals that don't change frequency. The ones that do change frequency, they then do, the computers, then do this on-off search. Do we see it in the ons and, and do we not see it on the offs? And you can do various levels of thresholding. How strictly do you want to require it to be in every time you looked? Um, you know, how, how sensitive do you want to look when you're nodded away for, for things? Because sometimes signals can vary in strength. Sometimes even, you know, um, um, uh, perniciously, they can do it at exactly the nodding cadence. Like when you have millions of sources, some of them are going to do this. And so there are various thresholdings that they apply to tune the number of candidates they have to look at to a manageable number. And so when it's all done, the computers spit out this gigantic list of the frequencies and the, the, the frequency changes that were measured for all the things that pass through all those filters. And then it's a human's job to take the ones that bubble to the top as the highest priority and actually look at the data and see if it looks um, looks like the sort of thing they're searching for. Speaking of uh, frequency changes, this one shows drift, but not quite in the way mm -hmm. that we would expect. This one is drifting upward instead of downward. Right. Any idea on what, what could be causing that? Yeah, so... Um, the the frequency is changing, which is good for it being in space, but right, it's getting higher pitched. And so at first that's a little puzzling. So when we observe things in space, we expect the, the, the frequencies to drop for the same reason that if you're um, watching very fast cars at a racetrack or something, as they go by the engine, the engine noise always goes from high pitched as they're approaching and then uh, they go down to low pitched as they go away. As the Earth carries the telescope around uh, past the, the target, the, 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 the pitch, if you will, of the radio waves will always be dropping. This pitch is going up. So why could that be? Well, we know if it's in space that the telescope is going to cause it to go down. So it must be going up intrinsically if it's in space faster than the Earth is, than the Earth is carrying the telescope around. And whatever it's doing, if it's accelerating out there, it's not correcting for its own acceleration to make sure that the, the frequency that arrives at Earth is constant. So to first order, that says, okay, if we were just looking at an ordinary astrophysical source, that would mean it can't be in space, because those should basically always drop. There are exceptions, but they don't apply in this case. On the other hand, if it's artificial, it could be, for instance, orbiting Proxima. And that's an acceleration that could give it a positive drift rate. So I don't think that particular piece of information argues strongly either way for it being technological. If it really is coming from space, I think, in fact, it actually argues whatever it is has to have it some significant acceleration, which maybe argues that it is artificial, actually. I mean, extraterrestrial, outside the solar system. Would that match with the movement of a planet? Um... That's a little unclear. I haven't done the math yet, and a bunch of us are actually, you know, thinking about doing this math. The problem is that we, we need to know what drift rate was seen, and we don't know that yet. We haven't seen the data. So we can only speculate. It doesn't match the rotation of a planet, because 
for the same reason we always see pitch drop when we're observing objects, that'll also be true for the transmitter on another rotating planet. Uh, but it could be from a planet's orbit. But until we know the magnitudes of the accelerations we're talking about, it's hard to say. One other interesting thing that I saw in the articles is that it appears that there is no modulation. This is just, for all intents and purposes, a tone. Yeah. Which, yeah, or a bell or Doorbell. a clock, you know. Um, <laughs> so yeah. anybody that's going to ask, is there a message there? No, there isn't. Not that that we've seen. <laughs> no, that's right. So this is what early SETI practitioners uh, called uh, a beacon, and today we use that term much more broadly to mean something intended for us. But the earliest SETI practitioner said what you'll what we should be looking for is just a pure dial tone, if you will, just one monotone uh, with no information in it, a beacon. And this this would fit that. This would seem to okay. fit that according to right what's in the news reports that they can't find any hint of modulation, which also makes me you know really curious because. I mean, I don't know much about radio frequency interference, but I would have guessed that most terrestrial sources or human sources of radio waves would be sending the radio waves out exactly to transmit information. And so I don't know how many sources would bother sending out a monotone like that. Although if it's on the earth, it's actually not a monotone. It must be rising in frequency for some reason. And I don't I, I don't know enough about, you know, um, radio devices on earth to know if that is something that happens, but it does seem odd to me. Now about the the length of the signal, do we know anything or do is that just gonna be in the paper of whether this, this signal was detected continuously for the whole time that the telescope looked at it at the various times that it did, or if it if it popped in and out or, you know. Yeah. Or is, is it detectable? I mean, can someone point a radio telescope right now there and try and pick it up? Yeah, based on what I've been able to put together from the news stories, it sounds like there was a very long set of observations on Proxima by the Parkes Telescope to hunt for flares. And so they were sitting on it apparently for hours, day after day after day, whenever it was up, to try and catch these flares. And then based on what I see, it appears that only during some of those observations did they detect this signal. So it does appear to be intermittent. Also, if it were continuous, I'm sure that the team by now would have reobserved it and we would not be talking about why it's hard to detect. If it's a always on signal that's narrow band, then they would have been able to confirm this in a matter of days. I see. So uh, maybe an intermittent signal that it, it, yeah, it must be intermittent or this wouldn't be a question. I see. Now, Anybody else looking for it? I mean, is this, what are the next steps, I guess? Let me broadly ask that question. Well, there's a few. I mean, one is we need to let the team finish their analysis. I think this story got away from them before they were done. And so that's why we're having these, you know, conversations with lack of knowledge because they weren't able to finish their analysis before the story got out. So the, the first step is to wait to see what they have. They've thought harder than anyone, except maybe the people who came before them, but they're in consultation with all of those people like Frank Drake and so on, about how to do this kind of follow-up. So the sorts of things I'm imagining that they're doing is scouring all of the data they have, not just of Proxima, but all the data they've ever taken with Parks to see if they've ever seen this signal before. Because if it is terrestrial radio interference, it's probably at some point been turned on before. And so have they ever seen it when pointing at some other star or you know, whenever there's equipment has been on? I imagine that they're also really scrutinizing those off nods to see if maybe it really is in those off nods, just much fainter. And then I imagine that they're getting as much Parks time as they can to point back at Proxima and sit and wait and see if the signal repeats. In fact, I'm sure they've already done that. Beyond that, though, it's a challenge. Depending on how strong the signal is, it's possible that they could use some of the smaller telescopes around the world to try and observe it. On the other hand, you need kind of specialized equipment to make these very high frequency resolution observations. And I don't know how many Southern Hemisphere radio telescopes can do that, that are available for this kind of work. The other one that comes to mind is the Meerkat array in South Africa, but I'm not sure that the breakthrough equipment there is online yet. So uh, depending on the signal strength, maybe the smaller telescopes at parks or their places in Australia. But the problem is Proxima is so far south that most of the world's radio telescopes cannot observe it. It's below the horizon for almost all of them. Oh, I have a painful question. Uh -oh. Would it have been observable from Arecibo? 
I don't remember the latitude of Arecibo. Up, uh, no, definitely not, because Arecibo is, is a is a zenith telescope. It looks up, and it can't look down toward the horizon, and it's northern hemisphere. So no way could Arecibo look at it directly up. Yeah. Well, there's that. Now, <laughs> here's the big elephant in the room problem with this signal. It seems to be coming from Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the sun currently. Yeah. And if there is an alien civilization there, that would imply that there are alien civilizations everywhere. Could you dig into that? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of assumptions that go into that line of reasoning, which I basically agree with. But let's pick some of them apart. One is that if there's a signal that it's coming from an alien civilization... And that that alien civilization arose in the Proxima system. On the other hand, you know, some of the earliest arguments for and against SETI involve the idea that life can spread, technological life can spread throughout the galaxy. And so you don't necessarily need life to arise on every star for there be something to find around every star in terms of technology. Um, another argument that's often been made is that if you want to communicate across the galaxy, doing point-to-point -point communication directly is a pretty inefficient way to do it. So for instance, today, if you call your friend up on your cell phone, your cell phones are not attempting to communicate directly with each other. The power requirements for that are, are just ridiculous. No, your cell phone, your mobile phone connects to the very nearest node, the nearest cell tower. And then that boosts the signal, relays the signal, and then there's this whole network of communication we have around the world and even to, you know, off, off the planet to satellites. And so your, your signal will take a really circuitous route, but at every short hop, there's not a lot of power required and the signal gets boosted. So that's a very ordinary way to do network communication. We do it all the time here in the digital age. And if that's how communication happens throughout the galaxy, then we would actually not expect to be getting signals from distant stars. What an inefficient way to do things. If, if that star 200 light years away wants to get our attention, they should use some sort of network. And the last hop that that signal would take would be from Proxima, our very nearest neighbor. And so a lot of people have argued that it is exactly the very closest stars, whether they have inhabited planets or not, whether there's a civilization there or not, are the only places we should ever expect to see radio signals coming from. So I don't know if you made me bet, and I wouldn't, but if you made me bet on which star would be the first one we would detect radio signals from, based on that argument, I would have to bet Proxima. It would absolutely drive me nuts if we found that this was a broke down von Neumann probe that can only send out a single tone, <laughs> but can't actually send its message. <laughs> yeah. Well, th there are going to be a lot of things we can learn. I mean, if this signal comes back, if it's intermittent, but it is, if we are able to pick it up, uh, if it really is coming from Proxima, then we'll be able to determine from its frequency drifts how it's moving in the Proxima system. For instance, is it in orbit? Is it on a planet? And so from there, we can probably start to think about what the next steps might be. Maybe there are weaker signals at other frequencies. You know, why would there only be one? I think there's still a lot we can do, even if this particular signal is boring. It's worth noting, though, that this is Breakthrough Listen. And another area of that uh, organization is Breakthrough <laughs> Starshot, right. which means that if we did get an alien signal from that system, it is conceivable that we could go look at it. I would say that before we got this signal, it was conceivable that we could go to Proxima. If this holds up and there really is a signal from Proxima, we are definitely going to Proxima to figure it out. I think that Starshot will suddenly suddenly get a lot more credibility if there's something that we're looking for there at Proxima. It would be amazing. Actually, that's an amazing yeah, scenario. It would. Actually, breakthrough in both directions. One to actually try and send an interstellar probe to Proxima. One in exactly opposite direction to try and go to the solar gravitational lens and use that to see if we can find any stronger ones. Amazing. That's a whole other story, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, the one last thing I wanted to touch on was Proxima B, or Proxima Story itself and Proxima B and the other planet that's apparently there. These are not really as you were you were talking about with with a possibility that it might be a station or something like that someone else's um station mm -hmm. to yeah. broadcast to us 
otherwise, this is not a very good uh, system for life, so far as we know, at least with that, you know, yeah. um, flaring red dwarf. So this was probably likely if it were a signal of, of it were a techno signature, it's from somewhere further away. It's just stationed there. And that there probably did, wasn't life there. Well, I don't know. You know, the habitability, the suitability of M dwarfs for habitability for life it's like a pendulum. For a long time, it was just ridiculous. There's no way. And then as the Kepler mission was getting going, people were like, why are there no M dwarfs here? And as they really dug into the reasons people said M dwarfs wouldn't work, though they all flare and things like that, they started to realize that those actually weren't very good reasons and that, and that the best way to find habitable zone rocky planets was to look at M dwarfs. And so, I don't know, I feel like the pendulum's kind of coming back as people think about these flares. But, you know, if you take a planet like Venus, thick atmosphere, you put it around the star, the thick atmosphere, just like it has on Venus, can prevent tidal locking. And it can also prevent, it can also uniformly distribute the heat of the star around the planet. And it will also act as a wonderful shield against all those flares. So I don't think it takes much imagination to imagine that a habitable planet could exist around an M dwarf, even if it's flaring, even if without a big atmosphere, it would be tidally locked. I think we just don't know. And then, of course, there's all of the arguments about life as we don't know it. So I think one of the most interesting things about finding technological life is figuring out if it arose where it is, right? If we see that signal, can we associate it with a habitable zone planet? Or is there really no habitable zone planet? Because one would imply life can arise on the M dwarf, and maybe we're seeing an indigenous signal, and the other would imply that, that whatever put the, the, the transmitter there has traveled across the stars. Either way, the information is priceless because it gives you an insight just without even talking to them. You know, it gives you an insight on what alien civilizations do. Yeah, that's right. I think the idea that we could decode these messages and that we're going to, you know, access Encyclopedia Galactica or something like that, I personally put pretty low odds on that. I... I like to say that, you know, if we finally find something, someone's like, well, then what are you going to do? And I like to say the S just changes from search to study. And we're going to have so much to study if one of these finally pans out. Looking for more of them, studying the one we have, uh, it'll be amazing. Well, and the, I mean, the, people always expect the, the sort of the science fiction take on it that it would be a contact signal and they'd send us some plans for a wormhole or something like that. But in reality, it may be that it, once the detection is made, the scientists may come out and say, the aliens have radar. And everybody will be like, <laughs> right, exactly. what, else do you, what, what else do we know? We don't know anything yet. It could be centuries before we know anything more. <laughs> That's right. But the nice thing about Proxima is that there are other ways to learn about the system because it's so very close. All right, Jason, anything else that should be noted about this signal that uh, you want out there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this thing is. As Pete Warden, the chair of Breakthrough Initiatives, has said, this is almost certainly radio frequency interference. I think that's right. I think it, it, it probably is. I'm, I'm puzzled by a lot of it, but like I said, I don't know a lot about radio frequency interference and why things we build do the things they do. One thing we've been exploring is whether it could be a satellite. I don't think it could, but it's an intriguing idea that some of us are kind of tracking down. But I think most importantly, this is giving the Breakthrough Listen team, and all of us really, an opportunity to exercise You know what we do when something interesting pops up. This is the first really good candidate that the team has had to wrestle with. And we can anticipate that there will be more because just because, you know, the longer you look, the more you'll find, but also because their equipment is getting more sophisticated. They are uh, getting time on more and more telescopes and they're searching in more and better ways all the time as this amazing project just ramps up. And so I think, you know, we should be prepared for this to happen again, even if this one turns out not to pan out and think about, you know, what that means and, and how we'll handle things the next time. Hopefully next time we will hear about the candidate through a press release by the Breakthrough team and not in this kind of haphazard way where we don't have full information. Leaks are never good or, or never accurate or never complete. <laughs> well, you know, some leaks are good, but some you know, it, it, are, but... it's been okay in this case. Nothing really bad happened. Like I said, the press has seemed to actually been pretty responsible with it. 
In any case, though, the study of this will allow SETI researchers to look at a new type of interference, at least, and know what to look yeah. for next time. So at least That's there right. will be that. That's true. All right, Jason, thanks for appearing with us again today, and I'll talk to you again sometime soon. That sounds great. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What? <laughs>